Yo, Salaikum. You guys can sit down, we're gonna get started right now. Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Bismillah Salatu Wasalam, Wa Allah Rasulullah Wa Sahbihi Wa Man Wala. Before we, get, we begin, we're gonna start off by hearing the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, so I'm gonna pass it off to Brother Musa. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِ اشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِظُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حملته أمه وهنا على وهن وفصاله في عامين وفصاله في عامين أن اشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير وإن جاهداك على أن تشرك بي ما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما وصاحبهما في الدنيا معروفا واتبع سبيل من أناب إلي ثم, إلى ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون يا بني إنها إن تكم إثقال حبة من خردل فتكن في صخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأت بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانهى عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور ولا تصعر خدك للناس ولا تمش في الأرض مرحا إن الله لا يحب كل مختال فخور وقصد في مشيك واغضض من صوتك إن أنكر الأصوات لصوت الحمير صدق الله العظيم تكبير تكبير جزاك الله brother Musa for the beautiful recitation once again السلام عليكم everybody welcome to our pre IW event just a heads up there's a lot of guys here uh, I mean, brothers and sisters both. There's, it's packed in this room, I'm sorry. Like, it's really small. It was out of our control. So if you guys can, just try to move up as, as much as you can. Try to move into each other. Um, I apologize once again. There's not, there's not much space here, but this is all we can work with. Uh, so please bear with us, inshallah. Um, so the purpose of this event, uh, Rutgers MSA uh, likes to under, uh, provide a good understanding for the people of Rutgers, right? The whole community of Rutgers with an uh, understanding of Islam through the Quran and its Sunnah. So today we have our talk on, uh, you know, giving giving Dawah through our character. So today I'd like to introduce Brother Omar Tariq, also known as OT, former YM National Coordinator. He works on expansion for YM. He's a Rutgers alum and he's worked with MSA and other various Islamic organizations. So without further ado, uh, Brother OT. Sayyidatullah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن لا ربي شرح لي صدري ويحسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقى قولي We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him and we praise him and we send peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله and upon his family وصحبه and upon the companions ومن لا and upon the believers until the day of judgment so first and foremost, I apologize for being late. Please forgive me for that. Um, I'm going to give three professions to you, and I want you to hold it into your mind. I wasn't sure how many people would be here. I wasn't sure if we could do a group activity, but I think, inshallah, we're going to try this. And if neither, if none of these professions mean anything to you, or these areas, rather, then you can come up with another one, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, 
no one has to share, but at the very least, inshallah, try to reflect. Many times we learn about seerah, we learn about the life of the Prophet and we treat it like history. We treat it like a sequence of events. And it has its place, right? We need to know what year so-and-so uh, was martyred. We need to know what year the Muslims were boycotted. We need to know what year they were kicked out of their hometown. We need to know when they finally came back, right? There is a, a place for this history. But for the people like you and I that are trying to make sense of our religion or even just try to find our way, for those of us who are trying to make our relationship with God mean something more today than it did yesterday, history alone isn't going to do that. So instead, we need to be able to take lessons. I can tell you a lesson that means something to me, but unless you and I are willing to reflect we're not going to really bring it to life. So that's what we're going to try today. Try to bring the life of the Prophet to life to us, right? The first profession you can hold on to, and so many, uh, many people's parents will be very happy when I say this, is some sort of medical profession, right? So some sort of medical profession, keep that in your mind, right? You get to pick one out of these three. You don't have to pick all three. If you do, you're an overachiever. You're not getting any brownie points from me because I don't care. But you get one, right? So medical profession, that's one. <laughs> Number two, something to do with athletics. Maybe it was you as an athlete before, a current athlete, maybe a coach, maybe an organizer, right? Something to do in the world of athletics. And number three, think of a consultant, right? Or somebody in business, someone dealing with people and that kind of transaction. Now there's other uh, things you can do. Some of you might be tempted to say, oh, I'd like to think about my life as a student. And, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, if you want to be a student the rest of your life, that's great. I can tell you, it's not fun, right? It never ends. Um, and, and to some degree, we'll all be a student. But if you tell me today that, oh, I listened to this uh, hadith, I listened to the story of the Prophet and it made sense to me when I was a student, in two or three years, it's not going to make sense to you anymore. You're not, you're not supposed to be a student the rest of your life, right? That's not what your trajectory is. So instead, I want you to think about who you want to be, right? Who you're supposed to be. Because the people of, uh, of that, at that time, the Quraysh, they looked at Muhammad ibn Abdullah before he received wahi, before he was known as the Prophet of Allah, before he was, was known as the Messenger, before the message came down to him, and they started to plan his life out. They looked at him for certain characteristics, and they said that because of these characteristics, we've drawn some conclusions. There were people that were very important people that started to say, I'm going to offer you my daughters to marry. And it would be a political marriage because I know you're going to be the next king of the Quraysh. Right? There would be people that say, I want you to uh, keep uh, a hold of something that's precious to me. Because even if I'm, I, I die and my family needs it and they're too young to take care of that, years and years down the line, I know you're going to hold on to it. Right? They start to look at who he was going to be. You and I need to do the same. We need to look at who we're going to be. So you can tell me if something makes sense to you as a student, but that's not what's going to be relevant to you for most of your life, right? So I gave you those three, right? Medical profession, right? Athletics, or some sort of business, or some sort of uh, consultant, some sort of businessman or woman, whatever the case may be. So I want to share some stories. The first story I want to share has to talk, uh, has to deal with... Uh, Something that we've heard many times probably, but I want to. There are two lessons that I got from it today that I didn't think about before, so I want to tell a little differently, inshallah. You are walking to class, right? You're on your way, you're walking to class, right? And somebody starts to say, Oh, let me walk with you, I'm going to class or whatever. And then they start to talk about you and not know it's you. And they start to talk about something that means something to you and not know it's talking about you. So maybe. Maybe it's a girl that doesn't like your younger sister or something like that, right? And they start talking trash about your younger sister, right? Or someone who says, hey, you know, um, I, don't like, uh, I, don't, I don't like daisies, and they think that you're Mexican or something like that. Like, whatever, you look like something else, I don't know, right? Uh, right? Or, I, or you know what, I, I have this problem with Arabs, right? And they think you're a white boy or something, right? Like, like something along the lines of they don't know they're talking about you, but they're talking about you. And they start talking smack. And they start insulting you to your face. Right? 
And some of you already picked out the story. The Prophet ﷺ was helping somebody, and she was older. She was elderly. And she needed help. I think she might have been moving. And she couldn't carry whatever she needed to carry, and she was just on her way. He comes to help her. Now he is the Prophet of Allah. So according to what most historians and narrations say, he is not just a young man anymore, right? He's beyond the age of 40. He has children, he's married, maybe coming home from a long day of work. How many of you are more busy now in college than you were in high school? Right? Everybody basically, right? And how many of you started working while being in college? And you're even busier now, right? I have news for you, 24 hours stays the same no matter what age you're at. It's always 24 hours. You'll have more things you have to do. We get busier and busier with each passing year, which in each phase of life. And what was important to me about the story is that this was not just some young college guy that has a break between classes. He was a process, he was a family man, he had other responsibilities, he had responsibilities to other Muslims that were trying to learn about Islam, right? Maybe they were being persecuted in Mecca. So what he was doing is he was still taking time from his busy schedule. And you'll find that as you get older, you're more and you're less and less inclined to volunteer the way you were when you were back in MSA and you had time. You're less and less inclined to volunteer. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tends to bless you more. Whatever few minutes you have, there's a lot more barakah in it. So he's walking with her, and she says, you know, this Muhammad, have you heard of Muhammad? And this is someone who wants to hear herself talk, so she doesn't care what he says. It's like, have you heard of Muhammad? Let me tell you about Muhammad, right? Let me tell you, because she's the expert, right? She's like, Muhammad is, you know, he's someone that if you listen to him, he's going to put some sort of magic on you. He's going to change your mind about things. He's going to make you uh, forget the ways of our people. He's going to make you turn your back on our culture, our cultural values. Right? He's someone that's going to make, tear his families apart. And she goes on and on. And she starts saying, let me tell you. And the entire time, what is his purpose there? He says, hey, I'm here. I'm here to help you. That's what I'm here for. Right? And he locks himself into what he was going to do. And focuses on his job. Right? Yes, we're human. You know, it's difficult. We have certain things that make us upset, make us worried, make us happy, make us sad. But he locks into his job. And his job at that moment was, let me just worry about this woman and her needs. Right? And I'll even go as far as saying that another amazing thing that I saw in this story is his ability to listen. Because when she arrived at where she needed to arrive to, she said to him, what's your name, by the way? Right? And then what he started to do, and the sheikh was saying this today, I was listening earlier, he started to say, you know that man you were talking about? But she didn't, he didn't just say that man you were referring to. He didn't just let things go in one ear and out the other. Because sometimes that's what we do, right? We don't like when people talk smack about us. So we allow the words to pass through us so that we don't have an emotional reaction. We tune them out. When something happens that we don't like, we tune them out. And we try to nod our head and be respectful. When in fact we're being disrespectful. Now is it a problem if we're disrespectful to those who are disrespectful to us? I'll let you decide that and see, do a litmus test in your life and see if your life gets better if you're going to just keep breathing that toxicity in and blowing it back out at anybody else who comes near you. Right? So what he did is he said, you know that man that you said tore apart families? And he's someone who would change change people make them go back on their culture you know that man you were talking about that uh you know he made us forget what our forefathers brought you know that man that came to change our way of life like he started to repeat what she said right he didn't just tune her out right and she said yeah he's like well that's that's me my name is muhammad right and there was enough that happened to her in that story that she ended up accepting islam now, if a person accepts Islam or not, sometimes when we don't have an understanding, we think that is the victory. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, right? That is not our purpose to try to get a, play a, a numbers game. For those of you who've been in YM, right? It's something that we always say, right? It's not about how many people come to YM. It's not about how many people come to an MSA event. It's not about how many youth register for a minna retreat. It's not about how many people came to the conference. 
I'll take five out of five people that benefited. Over 500 people that came for the hype and don't even know what happened in the talk afterwards, right? It's about how many people benefit. It's about if you as an organizer benefited by making an effort, making a sacrifice, fee to be the love, right? So he's, a, he's, he's showing exemplary character to her. He's listening to someone who's disrespecting him and he's helping her. And for her, she found enough benefit. She's like, you know what? Whatever you are doing, I want a piece of that. Whatever is making you behave in the way that you're behaving, I want some of that. You know, And you will find that those people that change their life with Islam, a lot of times it doesn't just have to do with the Qur'an that you handed them. Right? It doesn't just have to do with the message itself. Because you know, I can give you the manual to a brand new car and that doesn't mean you're going to buy it. But you'll remember driving that car and you'll remember how you felt when you drove that car. You remember how that car made you feel the same way you remember how that person made you feel when they handed you that Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ made this woman feel a certain kind of way. How did he make her feel? Who can give me something? How did he make her feel? You just raise your hand, just give me something. I'll just call on YM guys, I don't care. So, how do you make, give me one thing? There's not a wrong answer here, we could just keep going. What's one way that he made her feel? One thing, tell me. <laughs> she was shook? Okay, can you translate for people that are not in 2022? <laughs> confused? Okay, she was maybe a little confused. Yeah? Yep. Listened to, right? Accepted, right? Her presence was accepted, even if she was being a certain kind of way. Absolutely, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Okay, maybe she was overwhelmed. I don't think he made her feel that way. I think she was overwhelmed by the situation. But um, like, let me go out there and just overwhelm every person I meet. Like, that's, maybe that's not that's the way you want to do things. Uh, what else? What else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah. Made her feel heard. Made her feel heard. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Talk to me about those professions. Talk to me about those professions. So somebody tell me one profession they picked. Anybody? Yeah? Yeah, doctor. Doctor, did you pick that? Your parents picked that. <laughs> <laughs> Remember I said medical profession. I didn't say doctor. You said doctor. <laughs> okay. How can you make someone in that profession feel respected? Like how do you make it respect? Yeah, I mean, let's make it let's make it happen. Like from this story, what's something you take from this story and put it in that field? If I was to be in that position, I'd make sure my patients are feeling like they're being heard. Mm -hmm. like their issues, their worries, I'm taking that and I'm giving them solace and giving them advice and making sure they feel comfortable to be in that setting with me. Right, right, absolutely. So you make them comfortable. You make them comfortable with you being there. You make them feel heard, right? You listen to all that. You know what happens to people in the medical field? Anyone know what happens to ER docs? Yeah. What? They zone out. It's, it's, it has the word out in it. There's another word. Burnout. Yes, think of Jahannam, right? So burnout, right? Burnout, right? What happens is over time, you deal with these... That's so weird, dude. What are you doing? <laughs> over time, you deal with these situations so much and so frequently that I think the word is individuation. It stops happening. That you no longer see people as individuals, and you just see them as you know a, a blur of people, and you start to say, "Hey, I'm going to. I know what's happening. I know what you're going to say." You don't let people complete their sentences. You don't let them feel heard, and you might have that, right? You might have that in your mind that I've seen this patient many times before. Your blood pressure is you know well over the 130 systolic, right? You're you're tachycardic. You're diaphoretic. You're you know, so on and so forth. You start going through these things like, I know exactly what's going on. You're describing the pain in this region of your abdominal quadrant, right? You're going through the, the list. You're like, I know what's going on, right? And you're thinking about the time that is take, it takes for each patient. And you're thinking about how maybe the time, your time is better used treating that patient and some other patient than listening to this patient, right? I have news for you. As someone who's transported people to dialysis, sometimes three days a week, uh, 4 a.m. sometimes, you go into their houses, you're picking them up, you're taking them to their dialysis appointment, they're there for four hours, you take them back, they're lying there, sometimes their whole day is gone because they're just so out of it afterwards. They're in their 70s, 80s sometimes. They don't even have that many years to live because people can't live without a kidney replacement after a while. I have news for you. 
I ask those people about their children sometimes, and sometimes they tell me that they haven't seen their children in a long time. Their kids are living in other states. They're in a nursing home. They signed the wrong document and their houses are gone and their wealth is gone, right? And I am more in their life as a healthcare provider than even their own family. You never know, right? Just what you can do if you were in that healthcare setting, what you can do to listen to somebody can do for them, right? And you know what? I'm not wearing a hijab. Nobody is going to know that I'm doing this because I'm Muslim. The same way that woman didn't know Muhammad وسلم, was doing it for a higher purpose. I have a problem with these, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, or I, apparently it's a platinum rule now, treat people the way they want to be treated, right? So if they identify as a dog, I have to treat them as a dog or something like that, right? <laughs> like, I would rather live my life treating people the way I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way I want my creator to treat me, right? Treat them with the mercy I want my creator. So what that does is I've removed creation from the equation entirely. It has nothing to do with them. But it has everything to do, you know, I'm treating them a certain kind of way. I'm talking, but it's not for them. Meaning if they give me their attitude, it's not for them anyway. It's not that they became less deserving of it. Dude, it's, it's like echoing. Reverberations. They can't hear in the back? Bro, I can talk without the mic. I promise you they can hear. I bet. I'm sorry. Um, so... We have now patients that they don't see their family, they don't hear from their family. And I realized at a certain point that I didn't ask for it, but I was more of their son than even their son. And sometimes they'd give you little things. They don't have much like, oh, I brought, I had this one patient. He's like, you know, I brought you cookies today, right? He has like a box of cookies and I don't even love those cookies, right? But he wants to give me cookies every morning at 4 a.m. You know, man, Allah bless that man because sometimes I was going to fast that day. I'm like, this is Sahur, right? Like, <laughs> like Belvita for the win, like, right? Um, and basically, basically, he doesn't have to know that I'm Muslim for doing that. The same way that woman didn't need to know that he was Muslim. That's why he was doing it. But you are a package, right? His day needs to get better because you're in his life. Yes or no, right? That's what it's about. And you don't expect him to give you cookies, right? I just got lucky, right? You expect that if you did it for the right reason, that you're going to read about this good deed on the Day of Judgment, right? I remember somebody told me, um, he's a nurse now, but he, was, he spent a lot of time as an EMT. And he said that he didn't always know what to do when he was a new nurse, but he knew how to not make things worse based on his experiences as an EMT, right? There are very basic human characteristics every single one of us can bring to the table. You might not know how to make it better, right? But I promise you, listening to somebody and showing them respect will not make it worse, right? On the other end, you might have all the knowledge that you need to pass your board exams. You know how to treat this patient and make them better. But the way you treated them, you just made it worse. Right? They're like, I don't want to talk to this, you know, PA. She's honestly so stuck up and she's a jerk. I don't want to talk to her. So she's actually helping the patient and she knows what to do. She knows what medications to administer. She knows what labs to order. But she came off a little rude and the patient's not having it. I don't even want to deal with them. I don't want to hear from them. Right? So that kind of respect. Okay. Second story. Um, Anas ibn Malik was a young boy And he was with the Prophet uh, Throughout his life uh, And he got to spend time with him uh, Not as an equal like companion But just as someone who was kind of running around So the Prophet sent, he had him as a gopher He said, hey, can you go over there Can you go take this message to this person Can you go to that person um, and, and tell them that I need something from them Can you go pick up something from somewhere that I left Anas goes outside one day After getting this uh, uh, task from the Prophet And he forgets Because the boys are playing soccer And he's like, you know, pass me the ball right? So he's out in the street And he's just having a good time right? He's playing 
right? And the Prophet Sallallahu was wondering what happened to Anas. So he went out to look for him. And he said, um, he found him, basically. He found him playing. So, remember, you're, or, you're older. You don't have a lot of time. You have kids. You have a family. You have a, you have a whole ummah to worry about, right? And he, what he does is he just kind of sits down and watches him play and smiles. And when Anas sees him, he remembers like, oh, snap. I'm about to be grounded. Right? Like, I gotta go. I gotta go. Guys, like, you know, I'll score six goals next time. Like, I'm out of here right now. Right? I gotta go. And the Prophet says to him, let's go together. Let's go ahead. Let's, you know, whatever, let's go together. Right? This is the same Anas, that, just to show another side of things, that when his bird died and he was upset, the Prophet said, made it a very big deal. That, hey, your bird died. And we need to handle things a certain kind of way. Right? And he showed him that importance. Okay? What, learn, what lessons are we learning from this story? What's, what, are, what are we picking out here? Right? We're no longer talking about a geriatric patient, by the way, for those who are still stuck in being a doctor. Right? What lessons? Give me a lesson. Somebody give me a lesson. Yeah? Give people breaks. Give people breaks. Okay. Cool. Yeah? Um, letting people feel their emotions. Letting people feel their emotions, right? I'm, I'm trying to score 16 goals right now. Let me be me. Right? Yeah. Okay. Let them feel their emotions. Right? What else? What else? What else? Yeah? Um, value people's matters small. You can value people's matters even if they seem small? Okay. What else? What else? What else? He's dealing with a young boy here. What is he showing? What is he displaying? Uh, I, I, I got tolerate imperfections because you're imperfect yourself. Okay. Tolerate imperfections. Sure. Sure. Yeah? Respect, okay. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Mercy, Mercy okay. Uh, hand out there. Ahmed. Patience, excellent. That was one that I was thinking, but it's not that your answers are wrong. I'm just, you know, biased towards my own answer, I guess. Um, so re- the respect is there, right? And a lot of times we we measure someone and we start to respect them more when they kind of meet our standards. So what does that mean? Um, I'm a Muslim guy and I respect another Muslim guy more because he has a beard that's nice versus the Muslim guy that walks in clean shape, right? I'm telling you, it's a real thing, right? These guys think that they got it. Like, this is like hijab, not hijab for us, like, just so you know. I'm trying to translate here, right? Like, we respect we respect them more because of their appearance and how they look, right? These guys are laughing because they just judged someone today. So, right? We're respecting them more because of their appearance, how they look, right? A lot of times, that's what it takes, right? So... Uh, all right, I'm a healthcare provider. I'm helping someone, right, on the street or whatever. And someone else shows up and they're wearing like uh, nurse scrubs. I'm respecting them more because I see their appearance. I'm like, oh, they're at my level, right? And I see a civilian trying to help perform CPR, and I'm like, you don't know what you're doing, right? I just have that bias or something like that, right? Uh, the idea is a lot of times. Without even realizing it, we have to kind of ascertain that a person is at my level for me to show them respect. When the Prophet ﷺ, who is more busy than any of us can imagine, and more busy than anybody there, and certainly more busy than a young boy, is allowing him to take care of his affairs before his own affairs are taken care of, right? Let's go play soccer. Fine. Let's go together. Whatever the case is. He is lowering himself to... Uh, Anas and showing that respect that's true, but he's showing he's displaying that patience, right? So now someone give me a different career Not the medical field, right? Because we can keep going with that So I gave you some other categories, but you know another category if you if you if something else on so I said athletics and I said uh, Some sort of business, but you can give me another one as well if for some godforsaken reason you want to go to law school or something like that, right? What else? Yeah Consultant, okay, so talk to me. How can we take this lesson and apply it to that? Mm-hmm. 
Right, right, right. So, so the, basically the, the idea is that you're a professional, you're coming in, and they're consulting you for a job. Maybe you're some sort of engineer or something like that. And the client says, I want six bathtubs and only one bathroom. Right? Like, and you're like, all right, that doesn't make any sense based on what I know, but I'm hearing you out. I'm still listening to you. And maybe it's not that ridiculous, but the idea is that you made sure they felt heard, right? And you expect, and you know you are more qualified than them, right? Right? So you're still at least showing them that respect to hear them out. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, anyone else have another example with the same <coughs> consultant business? Y'all are in school, it's time to think. Anyone else? Business, consulting. How do we show respect? I can give you mine, but uh, I want to hear at least one more person. So business and consulting. How do we show respect? Yeah? Just being honest with the client about okay. limitations. Okay, being honest with the client about limitations. Um, has, does that, can we get one that relates maybe to some of these stories? Uh, the Prophet Sussan was known to be very honest, that's true. Um, and letting them know, like, this is not feasible. I don't know if we can do this. So there are limitations. Okay, what else? I guess in this case, his limitation was when he had to get things done, he came outside. He didn't just wait. He came outside. He's like, all right, I have a limitation. I have to get this done. But he came outside. Okay. But he was nice about it. Uh, what else? What else? Anything else? So one of the things that I do as a consultant, um, and this is this actually, like, I don't usually rip on why I'm like this, but I'll rip on why I'm just for a moment. Um, YM has this weird, uh, YM, YM guys and girls sometimes become a little ageist, right? So as soon as you uh, are beyond a certain threshold, right, uh, you're no longer relevant, you're no longer important, and you just like make jokes like, oh, this guy is 26, what a Buddha sub, right? Like, this guy is so old, right? Get married. Get married, yeah, thank you. Um, after you. <laughs> so when they get to a certain point, they're like, you're no longer relevant, right? Now, that's great when you have a lot of Muslim friends uh, and you have people you can pick or you have a lot of good friends of a certain age range. You don't need your elders, right? You don't need people that are 30. You don't need young professionals. Like, all right, you're not relevant, right? But I've gotten the opportunity to travel to other communities, alhamdulillah. And there are some places, I remember the Kentucky guys called me one day and they said, we don't know where to eat. I don't know what the hell you talking about. Go to the store and eat. Like, what do you, what do you, what, what do you need, right? We ran out of halal restaurants. We're getting tired of eating pizza, right? That's not a problem we have in New Jersey, alhamdulillah, right? And it's something that kind of opened my mind, right? At that point, it didn't matter that they were younger than me or that I was older or whatever the case is. And that happens all the time. So when you really, truly want to level with someone on a business level, on a consulting level, when you're trying, you, you forget about the things that like age, the things that are superficial, the lines that society drew for you. You forget that this is a practicing uh, you know, Muslim versus this is a non-practicing Jew or this is an agnostic person or this is someone who's, like, this is someone who's trying to figure it out versus this is someone who's identifying as atheist, this person's straight, this person's gay. Like You throw those labels out for a moment. It wasn't about that, right? The Prophet ﷺ was the prophet of Allah. He had the highest label. And yet when you go back to hear what George Orwell says about him, what, what Gandhi says about him, about these non-Muslims, what they say about him. When they studied him historically, they fell in love with how he treated people, right? That's the theme of what we're talking about. So you're consulting with someone, you are the expert. You know more. You are more capable than them. They're paying you to come in. Your time is valuable. Wasn't that the process of the situation? He knew more, he can get the job done more, he's an adult, if nothing else. He can get the job done easily, his time is extremely valuable. But how he handled that situation is he didn't embarrass Anas for making a mistake. Not even just not being as capable, but for making a mistake. It's easy to be a welcoming and great person when things are going your way. Your khuluq, your true character, comes out when you're in moments of difficulty, right? And this is a side point, Khadija radiallahu anha, uh, she knew this. So when she wanted to propose to the Prophet right, she sent him on a journey with Maysara. Maysara who was one of the servants for her. And he went on the journey with the Prophet at that point, 
the Prophet did not receive why he was just a man, he was just doing his thing, he's just running his business. And he, she said, come back and tell me, how was he on this journey? And it was a difficult journey, it wasn't an easy one. And he said, Mesa said that there's this person was incredible. I've never met someone like this. His character was off the charts, right? When we were put in moments of difficulty, that's when you know who they are, right? Khadija wasn't with him. You can put on a show, you can dress all nice, you can try to impress someone you want to impress, but now when you're put in moments of difficulty, who are you? When the clock is ticking and your boss wants results and you're supposed to close this deal, who are you? How are you treating the person? Who's wasting your time? Right? This is who Muhammad was, right? He had other things to do, but he didn't make people feel rushed and disrespected or less effective or less qualified, right? So, third one was athletics, right? <clears throat> Ali radiallahu anhu was getting his butt kicked one day, right? Why? Because he was found in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Where was the Prophet ﷺ? He was gone. He was out to Medina, fleeing for his life. And someone could say that, you know, oh, this is your Prophet, he left Ali behind, um, you know, to, to kind of be as like a, like a um, in disguise or something, so they won't know that he left or something like that. Ali was getting beat up, and they said, they were kind of saying this, they're kind of talking bad about the Prophet, like, this is your Prophet, basically, he left you behind, and now you're going you're gonna to feel our wrath, we were looking for him, we were trying to end him, we were trying to kill him, right, at this point, just for context, the people of Mecca, they disliked what social change and religious change was happening to society so much, that they're like, we have to put an end to this. They disliked it so much that they went to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they went to him, they said, you know, we will make, we will give you, you can marry any of our daughters, we'll give you women. You can take as much money as you want, we'll give you wealth, you know. We'll give you power, political power, you make all the decisions to stop preaching this Islam. Because the changes that are happening only within a few years, they're catastrophic changes. You're telling us that this poor man can pray next to this king in the same mosque? You're telling us that we have to free our slaves? You're telling us that you know we're rewarded for being kind when someone is beneath me and I shouldn't even talk to them? You're telling us that this is what this religion is calling to? Why should I do this? So they said, we'll give you everything. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that if you give me the only two sources of light, you give me the sun in one hand and the moon in the other, I would never give up this religion. I would never give up calling to what I'm calling to. Right? So he was so devoted, but he was running for a reason. He was on his way out of Mecca to Medina. He had a very important thing to accomplish for this ummah. And yet there was something that he was worried about before leaving. Before he made this hijrah. So Ali told them, do you know why I'm here? As he's getting beat up. They said, why? This is because your people who have boycotted us basically right you've withheld food and water from us your people who have uh disrespected us your people who have hurt us even killed some of us some of your people they left ten dollars with the prophet they left a hundred dollars with him they left something valuable with him amongst your people you don't even trust each other but everybody knew that the man Muhammad Wasallam was, right? Most of you are not 25, right? Before even that point, right? But even at that point, his reputation was someone who was so trustworthy that they, left, they put money in the account. And they said, you take care of it. You're our bank. You take care of my valuables. I'm going on vacation, right? Oh, you have a cousin. Can't this cousin watch your car? No, I don't trust my cousin. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me give it to Muhammad. And then Muhammad starts calling to something that goes against what their forefathers called to. And some of them became enemies of him as a result of that. And yet they still trusted him. They said, listen, we don't like what you're saying. But we cannot say that your character has gone lower. 
You have always been trustworthy, and even now you're still you're on the other side of things. You know, you're someone of a, uh, of a of a different class. You're someone of a different ethnicity. You're someone of a different religion. You're someone of a different orientation. Whatever the case may be, you're just different from us, but we cannot take that away from you. You are trustworthy. So Ali said, I'm getting beat up now because Muhammad Sallallahu would not leave unless somebody was watching the things that you asked him to watch. Right? Even as you are literally kicking him out of his hometown. And the sheikh who told the story, he gave an example that if you gave somebody $100 to hold on to, and then they insulted you, you would basically go to them, listen, I'm cutting off all ties, I don't want anything to deal with, deal with you, you know? I wish you the best life ever, let me get my $100 back, I don't trust you, right? You take it to that point. Then when somebody, when somebody disses you, when somebody has, doesn't have kind things to say about you, when someone completely undermines your authority, right? When someone fouls you, right? When someone like hits you hard in the game and it's just not part of the game, when someone lies, when someone's cheating, right? Tempers are rising, right? When you're on that field or on that court and you have to decide who are you really, right? Where, who is the person that you show to people when you're dressed up in front of an MSA event? Who are you really when times get tough? And the patient's yelling and screaming at you, right? For trying to save their life or their family members pulling your arms off of them when you're trying to hold their bodies up as they're stroking out of their minds, right? Who are you really in those moments of difficulty, right? That's the theme, right? And what do we have here? Even though he was fleeing for his life, he still was worried about his enemies' uh, goods. And these enemies, by the way, they didn't have that kind of honor because when the Muslims went to Medina, they started to take from their their things, their goods, or whatever their wealth, and that later on led to um, one of the one of the first battles of the Muslims. Like we need to take our wealth back, but that's a, that's a side point, that's a historical point, an academic point. Um, for someone who's an athlete, or someone who's had an athletic experience, or someone who's coached before or someone who's dealt with athletics where does this trust play a part anyone have an example it's very easy by the way very easy yeah there's no iron team there's no iron team okay so what does that mean in terms of trust it's any team sport it's the, the sum of all the parts so it's only your, only your, your success when it goes as far as how much you trust them. Okay, yeah, trusting those around you is a big thing. I mean, and not everyone's going to understand unless they have an experience like that. I, I understand a little bit what you're saying. I'll, I'll give that into context a little bit. Sometimes when you're playing a sport and someone thinks you're not good and you're on their team, they ice you out a little bit. They only want to talk to you when they want the ball, and they'll never give you the ball when, it's, when, when they have it. Anyone ever felt that before? You get iced out, right? It's because you suck, right? <laughs> you literally ask for it, right? But when that happens... You lose trust and you break trust with your teammates, right? And if you play competitive volleyball, that's the worst because you you rely on your teammates, right? You're diving on the floor to keep the ball in the air on defense, and when it's offensive, the setter doesn't think you're good enough to give you that hit, right? And the drug addict in you is going crazy because you just want that hit, right? I'm just joking. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I got some Narcan on me, bro. Really. <laughs> so, but the point is. There's a trust that's being built up in your team, and you can have more skilled players, right? But because you can't work as a t with team chemistry, we've had teams of people that were 40, 50 years old, all of them, 60 years old, and they're beating kids of a bunch, they're beating teams of 20, 21 years old. Why? Because they trust each other. They have that team chemistry. They keep that trust alive, right? And when, you know, it's, it's a microcosm of society, it's just a sports team. It doesn't mean anything to anybody, but you feel respected. When someone shows you that they trust you. And when they show you that they don't trust you, you feel disrespected. It does happen. A person goes home and they might have won a game, but they can't study, they can't think. You know, student athlete is just thrown out. You just can't even do the student part. You're just, the trauma is going through your head because your teammates didn't trust you. And you feel disrespected. And the rest of your evening is absolutely ruined. You can't think of anything. You're in a bad mood. You're mouthing off to your parents. You don't want your siblings to bother you. Right? You're just in a terrible mood. And you won the game. You won the game. But you're pissed off. Right? Any other examples in athletics with trust? 
Coach, yeah. All right. So what's what's the example? He trusts his team to do whatever tactic he likes. Maybe, but I think it's actually the opposite. The team has to trust their coach too, right? So like, yeah, he trusts the team to execute. The coach can't go out there, right, and start playing for them. But the team has to trust the coach knows what they're talking, what he's talking about. He's like, no, I want to bring up the ball. No, that's not your job. You have the best handles in the court, but you're six five. Get under the rim, right? You're not bringing up the ball. It's a waste, right? We're gonna exhaust you going up and down. Right, playing, being in the court, you're not, you don't belong. Front court, back court, right? I'll give you this example. Um, it's funny because I was taking one of these, one of these shayuf to the airport, and he was ripping on me. He's like, uh, basically like, oh, you, you play soccer? It's not the sport with like really short shorts. Like he was just messing with me, right? <laughs> but years later, I played soccer for a long time. Alhamdulillah, I started a group. We play frequently. Um, I have to actually make an event for tomorrow. We're playing inshallah, um, and. In this group, it's Muslims, non-Muslims, right? It doesn't matter. Anybody who can, who's good enough to play, they come and play. If you're not good enough, you're going to get hurt, and probably you won't come back of your own accord, right? So we play, and I, I didn't start off running this group, but they asked me to run it at some point. And every week, we collect money, and we pay money to the township, right? And every week, sometimes you have to yell at these full-grown men, all right, get on this side of the field. We're picking teams. We're doing this. We're doing that, right? 30 people, 40 people, 50 people, 60 people. Like, we dealt with all those numbers. I didn't ask to lead it. They asked me to lead it at some point. I'm dealing with it for a couple of years now. And literally, sometimes hundreds of dollars, sometimes like a thousand dollars, thousand plus dollars of just people giving money so that we can pay for it. And I'm like, how did I even end up with this responsibility? And I told these guys, I said, like, listen, I'm like, someone else can take over or whatever. And they said, no, we trust you. And subhanAllah, Adim, when you're with people who know you and know your reputation, especially within your religious background, that's one thing. But as soon as you start to be around people that don't know you, did not necessarily grow up with you, they don't, they're not part of the same culture as you, they're not part of the same religion as you, and they start to trust you, that is a, a huge pat on the back that you're going in the right direction, alhamdulillah. Right? I'm sitting there sweating it and saying, oh, I have to be firm, but I have to be kind, I have to be just, I have to do this, I have to do that. I'm trying to give them the worst example, but it's like the best I can do, but it's a terrible example of how the Prophet ﷺ was as a leader, right? It doesn't mean anything to anybody. I'm running a soccer group. It has no consequence to the outside world. But you're given a task, and you're trying to do the best you can at that task, and you're trying to be a just ruler, and you're trying to spend the money only in the way that you're supposed to spend it. And people even tell you, you know you can like make money off this. I'm like, I'm not trying to make money off this. I'm trying to collect the money, pay the money, that's it, move on. Right? And that's where your, your, your values come out. Are you trustworthy? Right? Years and years later, they don't want anyone else dealing with the money. They want a Muslim dealing with their money. Right? Are you trustworthy? Right? And by the way, I gave, I don't know if anyone caught this, I gave three levels here. I don't care if you're dealing with geriatric patients or, or elderly people. I don't care if you're dealing with children. Or I don't care if you're dealing with fellow athletes that you're literally like running into them, knocking them off the ball, and a few plays later fouling them, slide tackling them. I don't care what you're doing, if they're your age, if they're your, your equal. Whether you're dealing with your elders, whether you're dealing with your children, or whether you're dealing with your equals. In any one of these careers, in any phase of life, as you move forward, I am not going to ask you to keep a Qur'an in your pocket and hand it to every person you meet. I'm not going to ask you to grow a beard or shave or wear hijab or not wear hijab. I'm not going to ask you to identify as a Muslim in every conversation. I'm not, if your name is Daniel, I'm not going to say that you have a problem for saying your name is Daniel. I don't care, right? Like meaning how you introduce yourself doesn't have to be outwardly Muslim. But if you believe in God, and you believe that you want him to have mercy upon you, and you believe in this deen, in this religion, and you are honestly trying to stay out of the hellfire, then maybe we need to consider how the people felt after you treated them, after you dealt with them, right? I'm sure you guys have heard that saying by Maya Amladu, I don't remember how to say her last name, but she said that, I'm sure I'm going to butcher it, but she said something like, you know, I have found this to be true that people don't remember what you said or what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel, right? They will remember how you made them feel, right? So, in all of these examples, you have the greatest man that ever walked the face of the earth and not reciting Quran at people and not telling them, I am the Prophet of Allah, listen to what I'm saying. 
What you have is how he dealt with them and how they felt afterwards. And by the way, the companions would argue. They would say, I am the favorite of Rasulullah. No, I am the favorite. No, I am the favorite. Because when he dealt with them and he talked to them, he would walk up to them, he would stand in front of them, he would turn his shoulders towards them, he would talk to them nicely, he would remember them, he would remember their names, he would remember what they, what's going on, he would ask them, you know, how's your camel, how's your family, how's this, how's that? He showed them such respect that they honestly believed that yeah, he likes me more than that guy, right? They thought that they were his favorites. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow it such that we live lives where our character speaks volumes for us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to understand who we are through our difficulties and who we become in a positive way. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow our community to benefit from us being there and not ever be a situation where when we leave it gets better. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it so that as we are on our journey, and it's okay, anywhere you are on this journey for this religion or for you know you're, you're, you walking towards God Almighty, I ask Him to make it easy on you. I ask Him to make it so that you're patient. I ask Him to make it so the people around you are patient. I ask Him to make it, and this is a dua of the Prophet Oh Allah, make me small in my eyes and large in their eyes. Right? Keep me humble, but keep me moving forward. Right? Whatever profession that you choose, I ask Allah SWT blesses you in that profession. Right? May Allah SWT protect all of you and allow that your da'wah going forward is happening whether or not you're talking about Islam. And I ask that if this is something valuable to you, that you only enter Jannat al-Firdaus and your family dies on al-Islam, leading all the way up to the Day of Judgment. Amin ya alameen. If there's something that I, said, that I said that was correct, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah. And if there's something that I said that was wrong, I seek your forgiveness and ask your forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah. 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 Uh, Jazakallah OT for that talk. Uh, inshallah, we can get closer to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu example. Um, for now, we're going to have an open Q&A. So if you guys have any questions, just raise your hand and then... Yeah. It is now. Yeah, so anyone got any questions? Why is Fahan still single? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have one question. Yeah, let's see what's up. Have you ever had a time where a patient talked to you and put you in a state of humility? Like humbled. Humbled me. Do you mean like in a, like a disrespect way or like just any way? Like, uh, this isn't any way. I think um, one of the reasons why I decided to keep moving on with patient care no matter what is because I realized that, and this is just me, but... Um, I found myself making du'a more, right? So many jobs that just end in a paycheck, you don't always care about what happens, you don't affect people directly, right? But can you imagine, right? About to get on the truck at the beginning of the shift, if you haven't figured out I'm to, right? Getting on the truck, right? Um, and making du'a like, oh Allah, I hope nobody dies tonight because of me, because I wasn't good enough, right? Someone said it today, right? Like. You learn medicine to practice it. You're never going to know it all. You're never going to be there. You're never going to be at a master. Right? And you have to be taught. And this is something that is a lesson non-Muslims taught us in our classes. And you know, it doesn't matter. It's, well, I mean to say it's not a religious lesson, but you know, you're not God. You don't decide. Right? So I think any time you're about to deal with something, you have to stick with what you know and what you can do. And there's just so much that can go wrong. Whether you were not prepared for it, or maybe you were prepared for it and you couldn't execute it properly, or you got in your own head, or you were distracted, or you had other, you know, uh, option, uh, other like distractions in the scene that took away from that patient care, or you did everything right, you know, everything right, and somehow, some way, that 14-year-old still went to cardiac arrest. You took him to the hospital. You thought he died, right? You could do everything right. So I picked this, or I picked to continue on with it because I realized that I made dua a lot more. And I ended up making du'a for my patients and um, like, you know, one thing outside of that is that like, 
You know, people really appreciate when you appreciate their culture. So if you know a little bit of their language, you know a little bit of you know what is is true to them. So like, um, it's just something small I do, but like I can speak Spanish a little bit. So like when I'm dealing with Spanish patients, my Spanish might not be perfect, but especially with the elderly Spanish patients, like I'm trying to talk to them in Spanish, and they are so much more comfortable because I'm doing that. Now I'm speaking to them in my broken Spanish instead of asking them to speak in, to me in their broken English, right? And I'm I, like I have to know what I'm doing. I have to know what I'm talking about, and it's hard, but. Um, you know, you, you, you realize that like, hey, like this person is calling you on the worst day of their life probably, right, a lot of times, right? It is a huge responsibility to be there, and it's an honor that Allah SWT chose you to be there at the moment. And, you know, they might never know that their EMT or their nurse or their doctor was a Muslim. It's not the point, right? The point is, like, are you going to actually care about their well-being to that extent that far goes beyond the practice of medicine. You know, no one's going to tell you in medical school to pray for your patient, but as a Muslim, you don't need them to teach you that. Yeah, what else? question was how do you basically deal with burnout and you know, we're talking with patients or we're talking like keeping yourself from uh, getting to the point where you're just disrespecting them you're you know going quickly or whatever you're not listening to them anymore um, you know there's a couple of things that can be done I think um, and this, not, I'm not an expert on this by any means but you know we have to reflect a lot right so Allah SWT tells us many times that you know uh, in the Quran, that those people who are going towards a success, they are the people that reflect on the Quran. They have a tadabbar of the Quran. And that means that you, know, you can open the Quran and say, well, I can't interpret this Quran. No, you can't interpret it, right? The, our scholars have done that for us, but you can always reflect. This Quran will speak to a, uh, as my teacher would say, it would speak to a 40-year-old man, it speaks to a 5-year-old girl, right? This Quran speaks to everybody. You can always reflect. So we as Muslims don't need to be told that, oh, let me meditate or let me um, you know, quiet the mind a little bit or let me you know, think and focus, right? We have a constant... Reminder throughout the day that I need to pause and I need to try to think back. I need to figure out what am I making dua for? I need to pray, right? That happens to us normally. That's like in our daily routine, right? But that doesn't mean that you don't have to do it outside of that. So actually taking a step back and thinking, how am I becoming as a person? How am I becoming as a, a practitioner, right? What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? What are pros and cons? There are people that they don't believe they can improve. For me, that's one of the most unattractive things. When someone thinks that, as my dad says, like they've arrived. Right? Like they don't need to improve anymore, right? Instead you gotta be thinking like, all right, I can always improve. What can I take from you know, what can I take from uh, this resident that's above me? What can I take from this you know third year medical student that's below me? Whatever the case may be, like think at every level, how can I improve? So one, have the attitude of always being able to reflect and, and turn back. And I think as a person does that, try to become a better Muslim, it's impossible. It is impossible for you to become a better Muslim without becoming better to the people. Like it's literally in the definition. Right? That those people, like, if you are truly getting closer to Allah, Allah, Allah SWT Himself says that you cannot forget about the people. Right? When you are getting more religious and closer to Allah, your Lord, right? Primarily that's what you're doing. A side effect of that directly is that your, your dealings with the people improve. Right? So that's one thing. Second thing is, who are your companions? You know, one of the things in burnout uh, I've seen in like the medical field or other fields is like, people are rude people. People don't work on their character. And that's at every level. People just don't. So you see it more in these fields because people are in a very high stress situations. So when you're in a high stress situation and you combine that with never working on your character, you have people that are absolute <laughs> jerks and D-bags, right? And they, they, what they do is they make a culture of that. And they start backbiting their patients, they're talking smack and they start going on and on. It creates a very toxic culture. Are you gonna surround yourself and allow people to have that impact on you? Or are you gonna have people that have your values, right? And surround yourself with them. So that when you slip up, they remind you, right? A believer is a mirror to another believer, right? 
like they remind you and they give you that like hey like i'm not a better or worse person than you but i'm gonna give you that reminder and by the way when i was in high school one of the best reminders i got in, in reflection sometimes was from my non-muslim friends that saw i was slipping up and they said listen like this is how you are normally and this is what you're doing i'm to bring it to your attention and they caught me I'm like, all right so i i'm not defining as muslim non-muslim I'm saying people who have good values right surround yourself with them and the people that are trash and they have bad trashy values right right and look i'm not trying to be harsh but you got to make like it's 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 you it's gender or not you know what i'm saying like you're 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 aiming for the top that's what you're trying to do this is your success here so you're going to surround yourself with people that are going to pull you that way and if people are not good for you then you don't need to allow them to have an impact upon you you did that you allowed them to have that right so you surround yourself with those good people so reflecting surround yourself with good people um and then i guess the third one i learned this from sheikh Mateen. Uh, he's one of my teachers, or at least like I hope to have the honor to call him one of my teachers. He does a crazy profession that he only works part time. So I think someone said it before about knowing limitations. Now that might not be limitations for him. I'm sure he could do more, and he has done more, especially during COVID. But if you're in a situation that takes a lot out of you, you don't have to do one thing. You don't have to do it seven days a week, right? Give yourself that time and energy. You know, nowadays people say, hey, take your mental health day, whatever the case may be. But like, you know, how about you design your life in a way that you're not killing yourself? Right? With things that you can't in your body and you are not designed to handle six, seven days out of the week. You don't have to work full time at that specific thing. You can work part time because you're trying to take care of yourself and you're trying to be the best at it. So what he told me is like he works in the ER and he says, by the time I get sick of it, I'm out. And by the time I miss it, I'm back in. Right? And he basically just works the weekends. Like, you know, and, and may Allah bless him and protect him and you know, uh, you know, Mashallah Tabarakullah, he, he does an amazing job. But I've never seen I started to see someone with a different type of balance that I had never seen before. Right? So Allah Alam, I hope some of that helps, inshallah. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Can I go home now? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah? Uh, Jazakallah, brother Omar, for uh, answering the questions even though it wasn't part of the contract. Um, yeah, with that being said, uh, we will conclude the talk for today. May Allah allow us to uh, improve our character and get closer to Him throughout the process. I mean, while us in the sand of your host, Ella Ladina Amen, who Amil Salihati with the West of the Haki with the West of the Sub. Um, real quick, stay seated uh, because food's going to be served to you guys while you guys are sitting. Um, does any spec?